Greeting to everybody in this room and all those joining us online. If you've got a Bible near you, open it up to Genesis 39. That's where we'll be this morning, Genesis chapter 39. I snapped a picture on the way to church this morning that I think kind of frames where we are in the story. So um, I've been watching. Do you kind of see what this is? Right? Have you noticed the pond out here? So all week long, I was watching this wonderful flock slash very annoying flock of Canadian geese, about 200 strong, I think, and the available body of water continues to do this, you know, February, Indiana, right, with me? And I, I pulled up this morning and I thought, isn't that a metaphor for life? I feel like God brought somebody to church this morning or watching online today, and you're just here for this image, that that's your life right now, that you feel like you're the, the goose, and, and you found yourself in the middle of Indiana in February, and you found the one last bastion of water available, and, and here's what's happening. And if you know, now they're not really, they don't move a lot this time of year, and they're just literally you know, like this. And in the language of our message from last Sunday, this is what a cistern looks like in Indiana in February. Remember the cistern where we left Joseph off? It's the, it's the place where it's, it's quiet. It's very kind of, uh, there's not a lot of activity. It, it tends to be pretty dark. Uh, there's not a lot going on. You wonder how you got there. You wonder how you're going to get out. Now, there's a whole nother commentary we could make about the Canadian geese. The fact that they have wings and can leave. Anybody else? Like, I look at them and go, really? You could be hundreds of miles south of here in much better climate than this. But, you know, you can study all the, the DNR folks who, I, I read this week that, did you know in the 1920s they thought the Canadian geese were extinct? So the Department of Natural Resources, God bless all the work that they do, they came up with this wonderful idea to save the Canadian geese. And now we have what we have on our hands that they're basically overrunning most of the populations in the north in winter. They believed that because they had wings, that when the waters froze over, they would exit. Well, actually, what they do is just find little pockets. So these are the geese who've exited all the other frozen over bodies of water. You with me? All of you joining us online in your flip-flops and in your shorts from south. You know, real followers of Jesus are in the north in February. Yeah. Or actually, you have wisdom is what I want to say to you. So. But that's where we left Joseph off. And I want to frame those of you who find yourself that maybe you feel like that, that's your life right now. You're sitting and you feel like just the sphere of life available to you continues to shrink and shrink and shrink like this. And you say, where is God and what is he doing and what's this all about? And there's a quote I put at the top of your notes and I put it there because I'd like you for you to reflect on it this week. I think it gets at the core of where our God in these kinds of seasons and chapters of life. It's from Parker Palmer. He says this, the soul is like a wild animal, tough, resilient, resourceful, savvy, self-sufficient. It knows how to survive in hard places. Kind of like Canadian geese when it's one below zero in the water. Think about this. But it's also shy, just like a wild animal. It seeks safety in the dense underbrush. If we want to see a wild animal, hear this. We know that the last thing we should do is go crashing through the woods, yelling for it to come out. But if we will walk quietly into the woods, sit patiently at the base of the tree, and fade into our surroundings, the wild animal we seek might put in an appearance. Do you follow what he's saying? When you pull up your weather app and you look over the next 10 days, we have like thrust upon us here in the north a period of time and a space that's going to be exceptionally quiet and mostly still and mostly a lot of inactivity. And it's very fruitful ground for the soul to come forth. 
Like, where is God in the cistern seasons of life? Remember, Joseph 17, we said he's quite youthful, and he's got some things that need to get formed and shaped in his character. He's kind of behaving a bit foolishly and, you know, acting out in his 17-year-oldness, understandably so. But God sees the whole arc of his life, and he says, Joseph, I see where you're going. I see the, the trajectory of who you're going to become, and a big part from where you are to who you're going to become is going to involve the soul. God says, I got to get to work on the soul. And you know how he gets to work on the soul? He invites us into those quiet places, those hidden places, those dark spaces, those ever kind of constricting spaces where you go, I can't see how I'm going to get through exactly where I'm at and what I'm going through. That right there. If we can kind of enter into this, embrace it, settle down into whatever our modern day personal cisterns are like, and many of you stood up last Sunday, we've been praying for you this week, many of you online, those of you online who put cistern in there, we prayed for you by name this week and your own personal journeys, wherever that finds you, if you can begin now to, to lift your eyes up and to see how God is coming to you. He said, well, what is he doing in that space? I think Parker Palmer's words shape it best. He said, I think God's coming to enlarge your soul. Do you know how you become a large-souled man or woman? Cisterns. The dark and hidden places. The space where it's quiet, where it's still. There doesn't seem to be a lot going on. And then stuff in here starts to make an appearance, and God's got some kind of ingredients to work with. And that's what's going on with Joseph, 37. And he leaves the cistern, and we left him off on a wagon ride. Do you remember at the end of 37, his brothers say, oh, there's some Ishmaelite traders coming in, 30, 50 cent pieces. That's what they sold him for. Well, they thought a lot of him that way. His robe was worth more than that. They sold it off. They sold his brother off to some Ishmaelite traders at the end of chapter 37. So he went from the dark and hidden place of a cistern to a wagon ride head, headed to who knows where. His brothers take his robe, dip it into some animal's blood, take it home to dad, Jacob, remember. Tell Jacob, hey, your son Joseph, he's been attacked by some wild animals. He's dead, gone. We've buried him. Say goodbye. So Jacob is grieving. His brothers are celebrating. And Joseph's off to where we pick up the story now. Several years later, he's in his early to mid-20s, and he lands in a place called Potiphar's house. Potiphar is a military leader in the Egyptian army, and this is where we find the storyline. I entitled today, for, uh, Faithful and Forgotten, and specifically want to speak in to that space in our lives and in our walk with God, where we may find ourselves being faithful and honoring God and doing what He's asked us to do, and yet simultaneously feeling like God might be inattentive and unresponsive to your personal situation and needs. That's Genesis 39. Here's verse 1. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, that's an indicator of why he would have so many servants and helpers, uh, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph. I want you to underline in your Bibles the number of times that phrase is used through this section. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, verse 4, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. So we're looking at three reflections when you find yourself in that space where you're being faithful and feeling forgotten. The first one is to notice here in the storyline that temptation often strikes in times of favor. Do you notice here with, with Joseph, now it's a long way from the cistern in chapter 37. I mean, notice the phrasing, right? Verse 2, he prospered. Verse 3, success in everything. Verse 4, found favor. Verse 4, entrusted with everything Potiphar owned. I mean, and the, the reason, the rationale, the explanation for why all the favor is, the Lord is with him. That you see, there's a, a large soldness to Joseph. Aren't you drawn to people who have a large soul? 
There's just something that's just like magnetic when you get around someone whose soul's been enlarged, whose relationship with God is thriving, who pulsates with the love of God, who just has endured the hardships of life, who've, who've just kind of weathered through the storms and allowed God to form and to shape. And here's Joseph in his early 20s. God's done some really good work from 17 over the last five to seven years of his life. There's some really solid formation. And for those of you in your 20s, I commend to you Joseph as a great character study. I think he's an outstanding character to study, and you're navigating the early stages of your growth and development as a person. Look at what happened in Joseph in his early 20s. The Lord is with him. He's prospering. He's succeeding. Now, what was kind of maybe forced dependence on God in a cistern? We all know when we hit those places, uh, you know, where life is just exceptionally hard, that it tends to drive us to our knees, that we know that pain is an unbelievable teacher, that there's spaces where we encounter experiences in life where we're just kind of forced to call out to God. The Psalms are filled with that. You know, I cry out to the Lord in the depth of my distress. That's like the, the, the cistern posture. That's the places where you're kind of forced to your knees. But hear this now. In 37, Joseph was forced to his knees in the cistern. In 39, he chooses it at Potiphar's house. And there's a big difference. See, temptation's coming to him now in the midst of when things are going well. When everything Joseph seems to put his hands to is succeeding. When he's flourishing, when he's being entrusted with more, when he's being promoted, when there's success and favor around every corner of his life. Just like in our lives, is there not a tendency in those seasons to become a little more self-reliant, to become a little less dependent on God, to find ourselves maybe not falling to our knees quite as desperately as we did in the cistern? So I think a better, a better window into maturity and to the soul work that God's up to is to pay attention to our priorities, our choices, and our values in times of success when we're sitting more on the mountaintop seasons because you got to choose it there. When you're in the valley, it's kind of chosen for you. It's kind of thrust. You're, you're, that basically the only way out is to your knees. And, and we praise God that he meets us in all the spaces in between. But I want you to see in Joseph is the character of this young man shining through. And for some of you who are going through seasons of life where for the most part things are going reasonably well, that you look around the, the general areas of your life and you have so much to be grateful for, you have so much to be thankful about, you look at the goodness of God and, and you just look and you go, for the most part, okay, right there, I would say, right there, you say, okay, what are my dependence on God, my trusting in Him, my calling out to Him? Versus a self-reliant kind of leaning in and trusting, I'm smart enough and strong enough. And so it's kind of that self versus God thing. You find it in this kind of a season. Temptation is going to come full court press now to Joseph. But I want you to see here the window is, man, this young man, his soul is growing. It is enlarging. As I put in my notes, perhaps the more comfortable our life becomes, the more vulnerable it becomes. Caution. For suburb North America, probably an important word. Certainly been a tough year for all of us. But circumstantially, when you map it out across the globe, we would be considered in the top tier of comfort and safety and convenience when you map it out all around the world. And you go, perhaps we're also equally the most vulnerable. Because when you hit the comfort, you have to prioritize and choose dependence on God versus the cistern chooses it for you. Well, let's see what happens now with Joseph. Verse 6, he says, now Joseph was well built and handsome. So on top of being super successful and all that, he's an attractive young man. He's a, he's a magnet for the ladies around him. And while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me, Verse 8, but he refused. I want you to underline in this section the verbs that Joseph it describes his behavior. Right there, he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, has entrusted, he has entrusted to my care. Verse 9, no one is greater in this house than I am. That tells you his rank. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing? That word wicked translated godless. 
How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Now, that's the definition of full court press on the temptation for a young 20-year-old man in this setting. It's a full court press. This isn't casual. This isn't tangential. This isn't on the edges of his life. This is front and center, right in his face, full court press of temptation. And I want you to see here that the principle is no matter how strong the temptation is that comes our way, God provides a way to overcome. There is a way to overcome. Notice the language that I had you draw attention to. He refused, verse 8. He told her, verse 8. Verse 9, how could I sin against God in this way? Verse 10, refuses to even be in her physical presence. Verse 12, runs out of the house. So here's what Joseph does. He does what he can in the strength that he has. So here's what happens sometimes when we're on the receiving end of what is normal Christian life. It's normal Christian life to be on the receiving end of temptation and trials and tests. It's normal. And so what's happening, look, look at Joseph here. He's, he's in a setting and he's finding himself thrust into some circumstances and he makes a day. He does what he knows God wants him to do with the strength that he has. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't say, you know what, let me pray about that. Notice like when Mrs. Potiphar comes at him and says, come to bed with me, he doesn't pause and say, can I have a few minutes to pray about that? No, he doesn't need to do that. He knows this isn't what God wants him to do. There are some things, right, in life, you don't need to take time to pray about it. You know what God wants you to do, just do it. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. That's Genesis chapter 4 when Cain was dealing with this sin towards his brother Abel. That's what God comes and speaks to him. Sin's crouching at your door, Cain. It desires to have you. But here's the key phrase. You must master it. You know what that says? God provides a way. Through the power of the Spirit, through the gift of the appropriate friendships in your life, through His Word, through the work of the will that He's given you to choose godliness and righteousness and holiness, that on the receiving end of temptation is normal, caving into it doesn't have to be. And that's what Joseph models. There are times, are you following me, church? There are times when you just refuse to go there. You know that that's not what God wants you to do. Why put yourself in that setting? That's that kind of stuff. You engage your will and you make a choice towards righteousness and holiness and goodness and truth. You don't have to gather some people together to pray about it. You don't have to seek godly counsel about it. You know what God wants you to do. Then here's what Joseph does. He just does what he knows what God wants him to do. Run from that, flee from that, get away from that. Just, oh, you know, he just, I'm out. I'm out. See the integrity inside of Joseph. It's inspiring for a 20-something-year-old young man. It's amazing. Look at how much has been shaped from 17 through his early 20s here. The cistern has done some good work. No doubt a lot of silence and solitude and aloneness when he's sold off to a foreign land in a foreign country, foreign setting, foreign family. He doesn't have a lot of community. There aren't a lot of people he can hang with. A lot of alone time. But you see the depth, the large soldness that wild animal has come out. And God's begin to work with it. Look at how Dallas Willard puts it. I think Dallas says it really well. Those with a well-kept heart are persons, hear this, who are prepared for and capable of responding to situations of life in ways that are good and right. Their will functions as it should to choose what is good and avoid what is evil. Joseph. And the other components of their nature cooperate to that end. They need not be perfect, but what all people manage in at least a few times in areas of life, they manage in life as a whole. So here's how the New Testament describes uh, this principle. Here's the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Put this in your notes. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted. That word in the original is called pyrasmos, and it means to be tested. It means to be under a trial. He's not going to let you have a piasros moment beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. Do you see that? That's the language the New Testament puts to what God said to Cain in uh, Genesis 4 and what Joseph models in Genesis 39. That being, I think Genesis 39 is Joseph's 
pyrasmus moment. It's a moment where he's on the receiving end of a great temptation. A full court press of temptation. A test or a trial is being thrust upon him. He didn't choose it. It was chosen for him. Circumstances are being thrust upon him. But here's what he's doing. He's engaging his will. And he's not caving to the temptation. It's possible to cultivate the kind of life with God where you don't cave to the temptations that come your way. It's impossible to try to live a life in this world exempt from temptation. That, that's not the way to look. You're always going to be on the receiving end of tests and trials and temptation. But what you can do is start looking for where has God provided a way? Where has he made a way? Where has he made a way through the temptation you're on the receiving end? Where it's crouching at your door, that's going to happen. But how can you master it? How can you overcome it? How can you engage your will and step towards what God wants you to step towards? I'm inspired by what Joseph has done there. And it may not be just sexual temptation. It may not just be a sin with your physical body that you're tempted to, though that may be the case. Maybe that's the current contact point of pyrasmos in your life right now. That you feel like right now there's a full court press coming on and cultivating a relationship that you know God doesn't want anything to do with. And so your step right now is to say, as a follower of Jesus, knowing who God is and what he desires for my life, I draw a line in the sand. I say, I'm not going there. You can do that. Now, you might need some counsel. You might need some guidance. You might need some people to pray for you. It's not, but you know enough if you've been following Jesus. Say, I know what to do with that. And for those of you in your 20-somethings, I think Joseph is an inspiring picture of how you handle your physical body in your 20s like this. I'm inspired by it. Our culture gives us no picture of this kind of, right? But listen, young adults, if you will steward your physical body as a temple of the Holy Spirit and honor and respect how you handle your sexuality, if you'll do it God's way, you will not get into your 30s, 40s, and 50s with piles of regret about stewarding your 20s with holiness with your body. You won't do it. I didn't say it was going to be easy. I didn't say you wouldn't be on the receiving end of a ton of temptation. A lot of things pull in your direction. But Joseph tells you it is possible from Genesis 4 to Genesis 39 to 1 Corinthians 10, there is a way to honor God with your body in your younger years of your life. It is possible. But you aren't going to drift into it. And you aren't going to do it without intentionality and focus and working and exercising the will. And say, okay, how does God want me to handle this? Not what the world says, not even what my friends say. What does God have to say about how I should handle this situation? And by the way, it's not just reserved for the 20-somethings. That's in any chapter of our lives, right? I sat with many, many of folks who have par piles and piles of scars and regrets of how they've handled their physical bodies and their sexuality. But I've yet to have one person say to me, I wish I wouldn't have done it God's way. And he loves us enough to set a vision for handling our bodies and our sexuality in a story like this to say it's possible. And if you find yourself on the other side of the line, you've crossed all the lines, you've made the mistakes, you've fallen on your face, then what you need to know today is it's not too late. You can hit restart. You can hit reset. You can get good counsel. You can seek Jesus' forgiveness and grace. You can rise up today. You can say, draw the line in the sand today and say, you know what, from this day forward, it's possible. It's possible. You don't have to keep caving. Just because you caved once, here's what the enemy's going to sell you. Well, you did it once. You just might as well just keep on piling down the slopes of sin. That's a lie. You don't have to do it that way. Whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, or beyond, you can do it God's way. Or it could be lines of integrity at work. For some reason, it doesn't have to be just physical body stuff. Maybe there's some things at work. You know there's some lines. You know where God wants you to draw the line. It could be with greed, it could be with anger, it could be with self-righteousness and spiritual pride. Where's the contact point of temptation coming to you? The fact that you're in the receiving end of it is normal Christian life. Caving into it doesn't have to be, and that's what Joseph's picture is. So I want you to see this first part of the story is J Joseph is being incredibly faithful. He's a young man who's really handling it God's way. God is with him. God's showing him favor. He's setting him in a setting where he's being promoted and he's got attention and now he's on the receiving end 
of this mistress coming at him, and he handles it the Lord's way. And now here's the part of the story where it says, well, he's being faithful. What about the, how's he being forgotten? Well, here's where it picks up. Verse 11 and following. One day, Joseph goes into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside, which probably for him was like, "Uh uh-oh, this is probably not a good thing. She, Mrs. Potiphar, caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. How about that? He would just literally run. For some of you right now, you're in a relationship and a situation, and you know that the most righteous and holy step you can take is to follow that right. You just need to run the other direction, and you know it. Now, when you do, Joseph's also a good picture. Things may not unfold like you thought they were going to unfold, but I think for Joseph, the long run, the big arc of his life, I don't think he regretted it. I don't think he regretted this, though it just got more difficult. Verse 13, when she saw that he had his cloak, left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. That word sport is, uh, we're like his entertainment. That's the translation. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. Verse 16, she kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. So Mr. Potiphar comes home, the owner and chief of the house. When she told him this story, that Hebrew slave you brought came here to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. Verse 19. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him, put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And if you keep reading in the story, you'll find out he's there for two years. Two years. He kind of creates a deal where he can get out earlier and they forget about him. So the third principle of when you find yourself in Genesis 39, when you find yourself trying to handle things faithfully, that the third principle of choosing God's way doesn't mean those around you will. Anybody found that? Maybe somebody living that right now. You're choosing to handle it God's way. Joseph chooses holiness, but it didn't mean he didn't have to deal with the unholy choices of others around him. Mrs. Potiphar. I mean, a bold-faced lie. Lie and manipulate the situation where he's tossed in jail as an innocent young man and then left and forgotten for two years? Can you picture? If he felt like the cistern was just a distant memory, he's got cistern part two. Two years in a dark and quiet and cold cell. Do you see? God sees the arc of his life and he just keeps inserting. He gives him, he gives him some breaks in between, but man, there's this theme through Joseph's life that God is building the interior work, that he's enlarging his soul, that he's deepening and strengthening the scaffolding of his character. He's doing that. And you see it on display like Joseph, he handles Genesis 39, he handles the Pyrasmus moment in a, such a God-honoring way, and yet he's on the receiving end of such a sinful act of those around him. Does that sound familiar to anyone else? You think of Jesus of Nazareth? He's like the poster child for this. When Jesus, the sinless one, comes to the earth, comes to the end of his 33rd year of life, and they arrest him, and they put him on trial. And do you remember the scene? That he's on trial, and he's up there with some well-known criminal named Barabbas. And everybody knows Barabbas is guilty. Everyone knows he's the well-known murderer on the street. And their custom and the ritual was, you get to free one of the prisoners. The crowd gets to decide. Which, by the way, is another good window into, right? Crowds and wisdom tend to not be the picture you get in here. Right? The crowds shout, free Barabbas. Crucify Jesus, the innocent one. See what Joseph is in chapter 39 and 40, Jesus is in Matthew 26. He's the one who's standing on the receiving end of that's not right. And when you find yourself in that space, you look to what Jesus models there. And I suspect kind of a foreshadowing of what Joseph's storyline is. You get a little windows into what Jesus' storyline's going to be through Joseph's. There's this little exchange in Orson Scott Card's novel, Ender's Shadow. I put this 
quote in your notes as well. It's a novel and it says this, do you know why Satan is so angry all the time? Because whenever he works a particularly clever bit of mischief, God uses it to serve his own righteous purposes. So God uses wicked people as tools? God gives us the freedom to do great evil if we choose. Hear this. Then he uses his own freedom to create goodness out of that evil, for that is what he chooses. So, in the long run, God always wins? Yes. But in the short run, though, it can be uncomfortable. And you don't have to live much life in a walk with God to find yourself right there. In the short run, it can be uncomfortable. And you see, this morning, God sees the whole arc of your life. He sees the whole thing. Whether you're on the, the, this side of the ark or this side of the ark, He sees the whole ark. And He sees not just who you are, but who you'll become. And in His love and in His mercy, He comes to you in the quiet and dark and hidden places called the cisterns. And He says, I want to do some soul work there. I'm going to settle you down. I'm going to quiet you down. I want to get to some work in here. And then there'll be seasons where you're out and, and maybe it's more chapter 39 and you're finding success and you're finding favor and you're finding increased responsibility and he, he sees that arc of your life and you're handling things the way God wants you to handle them. You're on the receiving end of no lack of temptations coming your way, but you're choosing righteousness to the best of your ability. You're choosing holiness. You're finding God's way out. You're resisting the pull to go to evil. And then you find yourself on the receiving end of the sinful choices of those around you. Your holiness pushes you into an environment where you're on the receiving end of a lot of unholy things done to you. And whew, thrust right, and then that ends up in a space of two years of being forgotten and alone in prison. No doubt Joseph, Joseph had to say, but God, God, where are you? Did you forget about me? I mean, the text says it's clear that the Lord is with him. And when you read into chapter 40, you'll say, the Lord is with him in jail. The consistent theme of Joseph's life is the Lord is with you. And part of the work of becoming a large-souled man or woman is the ability to see how God is with us when sometimes we have a really hard time seeing it. It's really, really hard when you're on the receiving end of the that's not right. But that's also, just like the, when the external set of circumstances around us become increasingly difficult, externally difficult equals internally fruitful. Externally painful, internally fruitful is the theme through Joseph's life here and the theme through our lives. When we, when we put the arc of our life and we, we map out the trajectory of our walk with God, we'll point to those seasons that were externally, no doubt, probably the most difficult, painful, confusing perhaps, but then you'll simultaneously probably point to those and say they were equally the most internally fruitful, soul-forming, soul-enlarging of any. And how do we know how effective this chapter and this season is for Joseph? You get to see it next week. You got to hold on to next week. It's all going to be on display next week where we pick up the story. Let's pray together. Worship team, come on up as we pray. Jesus, thank you for Joseph, for his faithfulness, for the, the picture you give us of a life that just has living and enduring so much of what our everyday lives are. Um, I think of some in the room who, you know, they just can't imagine their life being more constricted and confined than uh, you know, that little, that picture of those geese around that frozen body of water and just go, well, that's life right now. And where are you? And then there are others who, you know, you've been in 39 and, and things are going well and you're finding yourself just on the favor of God and rejoicing in the goodness of God. And yet then also there's kind of a full court press of temptation, a pull to go your own way, perhaps self-reliance or indulging in greed or anger or lust or pride or where is that pull? And then there are still others, I suspect, have, have been handling things God's way, but having to deal with a lot of folks around you who aren't. So would you grant them the grace, grant them the love and the strength? 
when they find themselves on the receiving end of the sinful choices of others and wondering, where are you, God? Open up our eyes to see how you come to us and how you work with us and how you form us and shape in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.